The line of kings is ended. The Witch King has killed the last king of Gondor, and the time of the ruling stewards has begun. Over the next thousand years, they would lead Gondor through further war, but also alliances with other men and a wizard. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we continue the history of Gondor. After the childless King Earnur is killed by the Witch King in Minas Morgul, it is believed the line of Anarion has failed. No one with any tangential claim to the throne would come forward, for no one wanted to risk another kin strife. At this time, Gondor is far from its previous heights, and another kin strife would likely have destroyed the realm entirely. Thus, the rule of Gondor passes to the line of the stewards. Mardil Voronwe, the steward who attempted to dissuade Earnor from marching to face the Witch King, becomes the first of these ruling stewards in 2050 of the Third Age. As explained in last week's video, the stewards were said to rule until the king returns for they had no proof that Earnor was indeed dead. Out of respect for the king's position, the stewards would never sit on the throne of Gondor, but in their chair of black stone placed below it. They would also never wear a crown, but simply hold a white rod, a symbol of their position. Upon being sworn in, each steward pledged to hold rod and rule in the name of the king until he shall return. While certainly respected, it is not believed the latter portion of this pledge will ever come to fruition. There were none in Gondor descended from Isildur's direct line, and by this time the northern realm of Arnor was wiped out, the sole remnant being the relatively small group of Dúnedain rangers. The rule of the stewards would actually begin rather well. Mardil is said to have ruled with a steady hand, which is how he earns the moniker Veronwe, meaning the steadfast. And fortunately for his descendants, their rule would coincide with the period of time known as the Watchful Peace. During Mardil's rule, in 2063 of the Third Age, the wizard Gandalf the Grey went to Dol Guldur to investigate the shadow growing there. Not ready to reveal himself, this necromancer flees, and for nearly 400 years, Gondor and much of Middle-earth would have peace. While Sauron goes to the east, where he would work to corrupt the men of that land, his Nazgul look inward. Rather than plan attacks, they would instead prepare for Sauron's return, giving Gondor a respite from war. However, Gondor would use this opportunity to strengthen its borders with Mordor and Minas Morgul. Hador, the seventh ruling steward, is recorded as the last of his line to have a lifespan of a Dúnedain living to 150 years. At this point, the blood of Numenor waned, and the lifespan of the stewards would shorten closer to that of normal men. The Watchful Peace comes to an end in 2460 of the Third Age, during the rule of Denethor I, not to be confused with Denethor II, who we'll meet nearly 500 years later. 15 years after Sauron returns to Dol Guldur, a new menace would be unveiled, the Urukai. Unbeknownst to their enemies, the lords of Minas Morgul had bred this new race of orc. Faster, larger, stronger, and smarter than typical orcs, the Urukai could travel in daylight without being weakened. They are unleashed from Mordor and conquer the lands of Ithilien and sack the city of Osgiliath. Denethor's son, Boromir, leads the Gondorian forces in driving Uruks out of Osgiliath, reclaiming the once great capital. However, this would be the final blow to the city. Already damaged and depopulated starting with the earlier kin strife, Osgiliath is completely abandoned after the attack by the Urukai. Boromir would succeed his father as steward in 2477 of the Third Age. And while he had previously won back Osgiliath, the steward would have to fight several campaigns to win back the lands of Ithilien from the orcs. While he would eventually win back the lands of Gondor, Ithilien would remain depopulated, and during the war he receives a Morgul wound. Despite his strength, which was great, Boromir would become shrunken with pain and die just 12 years into his rule. The rule of Gondor passes to Boromir's son, Kirion, who would become one of the realm's most famous stewards. 
He takes leadership of a kingdom where the Corsairs of Umbar have begun raiding the coasts once more. Ithilien, the land bordering its closest enemy, is deserted, and their northern province of Kalinarthon is almost completely depopulated. Between Kalinarthon and the forts along the Anduin having been long abandoned, Kirion's primary concern is invasion from the north. He sends out spies so that he may be informed of any coming threats, and his men return with dire news. A new group of Easterlings has emerged, the Balkoth. Likely descended from the Wayne Riders, the Balkoth were under the shadow of Dol Guldur, and using a large number of wagons, they were making their way westward. In the spring of 2509, Kirion receives word that hosts of these men are mustering along the southern border of Mirkwood, preparing to invade Gondor. Desperate for aid, Kirion sends out six volunteer riders to seek out their old allies, the Eothed, from the far north. Of the six riders, only one would survive the 950-mile journey. Borondir delivers the Red Arrow, a symbol of the dire circumstances and a call for aid to King Eorl the Young. Knowing the chances of word reaching the Eothed were slim, and not knowing how they would respond, Kirion musters as great a force as he is able. He personally leads the army north to meet this new foe. However, the Balkoth cross the river Anduin and overpower the Gondorians, driving them north over the Limlight River. A bad situation gets worse as orcs descend from the Misty Mountains, pinning Kirion against the Anduin. In this moment when hope was lost, there was a sudden sounding of horns. The riders of Eorl had come. The Eothade turned the tide of battle, driving the enemies away and pursuing the Balkoth across the fields of Kalinarthon. Three months later, Eorl comes to the Maring stream at the request of Kirion. Since the Battle of the Field of Celebrant, Kirion had cleared the path to Amon Anwar. Kirion offers Eorl all the lands of Kalinarthon and for their people to live in perpetual alliance with one another. Eorl accepts, and their two parties ascend the hill where Kirion reveals the secret tomb of Elendil. With his own son Halas, two counselors of Gondor, and the Prince of Dal Amroth as witnesses, Kirion pledges his bond with Eorl and his people. In response, Eorl pledges an oath of his own. Hear now all peoples who bow not to the shadow in the east. By the gift of the Lord of the Mundberg, we will come to dwell in the land that he names Kalinarthon. And therefore I vow in my own name, and on behalf of the Eothade of the north, that between us and the great people of the west, there shall be friendship forever. Their enemies shall be our enemies, their need shall be our need. And whatsoever evil, or threat, or assault may come upon them, we will aid them to the utmost end of our strength. This vow shall descend to my heirs, all such as may come after me in our new land, and let them keep it in faith unbroken, lest the shadow fall upon them, and they become accursed. Kirion then made answer, Standing to his full height, he laid his hand upon the tomb, and in his right hand held up the white wand of the stewards, and spoke words that filled those who heard them with awe. For as he stood up, the sun went down in flame in the west, and his white robe seemed to be on fire. And after he had vowed that Gondor should be bound by a like bond of friendship and aid in all need, he lifted up his voice and said, this oath shall stand in memory of the glory of the land of the star, and of the faith of Elendil the faithful, in the keeping of those who sit upon the thrones of the west, and of the one who is above all thrones forever. Invoking the name of Iluvatar himself, such an oath had not been heard in Middle-earth since Elendil himself swore an allegiance with Gil-galad to form the last alliance of elves and men. Thus, Eorl becomes the first ruler of a new kingdom, the Kingdom of Rohan, ever after in alliance with the men of Gondor. The names Rohan and Rohirrim being devised by Kirion's son, Halas. With Amon Anwar no longer making the midpoint of Gondor, Kirion removes the tomb of Elendil and has it placed in the hallows of Rathdinin in Minas Tirith. 
The following 200 years would largely be peaceful ones for Gondor. Between 2628 and 2655, during the rule of Belek Thor I, we are told the Corsairs of Umbar once again become a threat to Gondor, though no specific battles or events are recorded. During the rule of Ecthelion I, the steward has the White Tower rebuilt in Minas Tirith. Standing 300 feet tall, the Great Tower shone like a spike of crystals, pearl, and silver. It would ever after be known as the White Tower of Ecthelion. The oath between Gondor and Rohan would be called upon multiple times over the coming centuries, though it would not always be answered. In 2710 of the Third Age, King Deor of Rohan would request the aid of Steward Elgamoth when Dunlending seized control of the Ring of Isengard. However, this came in a period of renewed war with the Orcs, making Gondor unable to answer the call. Elgamoth's son, Baron, would spend much of his rule fighting the Corsairs of Umbar. During the long winter of 2758 to 2759, Gondor is assailed by three great fleets from Umbar and Harad, along the Gondorian coast as far north as the mouth of Isen. The northernmost of these forces joins with the Dunlendings in attacking King Helm Hammerhand's Rohan. Both kingdoms under attack, neither Gondor nor Rohan could assist the other for a long while. However, with spring on the horizon, Baron's son Baragon defeats the invading Corsairs and Haradrim. Thus, Gondor is finally able to send aid to Rohan, fulfilling the oath. Both Gondor and Rohan would survive these attacks, though Rohan's capital of Edoras was under enemy control for much of the winter. In the aftermath, Gondor is visited by one of the Astari. The wizard Saruman comes to Baron and requests permission to dwell in Isengard. Baron gladly agrees to having a wizard ally on the northern border of Rohan and gives him the key of Orthanc. Saruman by this time had already been seeking his own benefit, having researched much of the Rings of Power and deducing that one of the Palantiri remained in Orthanc. During the rule of Baron's son, Baragond, Gondor would once again be troubled by orcs. However, these orcs were not from Mordor. Instead, they were orcs fleeing the Battle of Azanabulzar, the climactic fight in the War of the Dwarves and Orcs. They take up residence in the White Mountains, and many battles would occur between men and orcs before the latter are destroyed. Still, Baragond's rule is largely a positive one, as Gondor begins to recover some of its strength. With the blood of Numenor still dwindling in the line of the stewards, Baragon's son, Belek Thor II, is the last to live to 100 years old. Upon his death, the White Tree of Gondor also dies. However, the people of Gondor would leave it standing until the king comes. In 2882, Turin II becomes the 23rd ruling steward of Gondor and would do much to secure the future of his realm. Ithilien was further deserted by his people due to invasions of orcs, but Turin II would not forsake these lands. He builds secret refuges for his soldiers in Ithilien so that they could combat this threat. The longest guarded and manned of these outposts was Henneth Anun, the very cave Faramir would take Frodo and Sam over 130 years later. But the greatest threat during Turin II's rule would come from the south. Ever since the Kinstrife, the lands of Harandor, also known as South Gondor, were a debated land between the Corsairs of Umbar and the Kingdom of Gondor. By the time of Turin II, the Haradrim occupied South Gondor, and from there, in 2885, they would launch an invasion of Ithilien with great force. Fortunately, King Folkwine of Rohan would fulfill the Oath of Eorl and sends many Rohirrim to Gondor. Thanks to the assistance of Theoden's great-grandfather, Gondor succeeds in defeating the Haradrim. Still, with this invasion, Gondor completely withdraws its people from Ithilien. The only ones remaining in the realm are the rangers of Ithilien, soldiers left to harass the forces of their enemy as they could. Around 2900 of the Third Age, Turin II would also refortify the river island of Caer Andros to protect Gondor from the north. The rule of Turin's son, Turgon, would be largely peaceful, but for one notable occurrence. In 2951, ten years after being driven from Dol Guldur by the White Council, Sauron declares himself openly in Mordor. 
and begins rebuilding Baradur. Just two years later, Turgon's son Ecthelion II becomes the 25th ruling steward of Gondor. Ecthelion II is known for his wisdom and used all his power to strengthen Gondor in the face of a resurgent Sauron. He would strengthen both the haven of Pelargir and Caer Andros. He would encourage worthy men from both within Gondor and without to enter into his service in exchange for ranks and reward. One stranger who comes into the steward's service is a man named Thorongil, who had previously served King Thingol of Rohan. Ecthelion grew to love Thorongil above all others, possibly even his own son, Denethor II. Denethor grows bitter toward Thorongil, and much of their council was in opposition. Thorongil advised Ecthelion to not trust Saruman in Isengard, but to instead turn to Gandalf the Grey. Thorongil advises the steward that the Corsairs of Umbar, the long-held enemies of Gondor, would prove a great threat to the southern fiefdoms if Sauron were to turn to open war. Ecthelion permits Thorongil to launch a surprise attack on the haven of Umbar, which severely damages the Corsair fleet. Thorongil could have then returned to Minas Tirith with great honor, but instead sends a farewell message to Ecthelion, for other tasks now called him. For Thorongil would indeed return to Minas Tirith nearly 40 years later, as this descendant of both Isildur and Anarion would return under his rightful name, Aragorn, son of Arathorn. For the final stage in Gondor's history, which we will cover next week, will be defined by the rules of Denethor and Aragorn, the War of the Ring, and the Dawn of the Fourth Age. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, CCDC Red Team, Nerd Sigman Anytimer, Pelkey Sports Cards, Moki the Brown, Christopher Carbaugh, Joe Tepper, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Bertelberg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, Grant McGregor, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.